Welcome back to this fourth installment of our lecture series on the general linear model. Last week, we discussed how you can model differences in means between two groups using regression or the general linear model. This week, we're going to build upon that by looking at how we can model differences between more than two groups using regression. When I first introduced the general linear model, I already promised that you could include predictors of any measurement level. So you've previously learned how to include a predictor of a continuous measurement level and how to include a categorical predictor that is either nominal or ordinal with two categories. And today we will discuss how to include categorical predictors with more than two categories. So let's look at an example of a categorical variable with more than two categories. For example, imagine that we measured socioeconomic status or SES as low, medium or high socioeconomic status. And we want to predict father's involvement in child rearing measured in hours per week of time spent with a child. So we have a continuous outcome variable, which is father's involvement. And we have a three category ordinal predictor variable. Today we examine how we can model this using regression analysis or the general linear model. Remember that we can use bivariate linear regression to model two categories. We expanded the formula in a previous lecture. We start with a regression formula that states that the predicted value on the outcome y, y hat, for every individual sub i, is equal to some intercept plus a slope times the individual values on the predictor variable x. In this regression equation, the intercept a is the mean of the first group. If we are using dummy coding, then the intercept is the mean value of the reference category. The slope b tells us the value of the mean difference between groups 1 and 2. And the variable x sub i is a dummy variable that in this case codes for membership of group 2. So everybody who is in group 2 scores a value of 1 on this dummy variable, and everybody who is in group 1 scores a value of 0. If we have continuous variables with three or more categories, we simply expand the model. So in this case, we get a function that looks like y hat sub i is equal to the intercept a plus the first slope times the first dummy variable plus the second slope times the second dummy variable. So what we see here is that we expand the regression formula by adding an additional slope and an additional dummy variable. And in this equation, we see three parameters, a, b sub one, and b sub two. And we see three variables, the outcome y sub i, and the first dummy variable x sub one for every individual i, and the second dummy variable x sub two for every individual sub i. So in this case, what do the parameters mean? Well, the first parameter, the intercept, tells us the mean of group one, which is the reference group. The first slope, b sub one, gives us the mean difference between group one and group two. And the second slope, b sub two, gives us the mean difference between group one and group three. So these two slopes allow us to compare the mean values of the groups that these dummy variables code for to the mean value of the reference category, which is represented by the intercept. In order to create such a model, we again have to use dummy coding. And in this case, we make dummy variables to represent membership for two out of the three categories of socioeconomic status. So this is the variable socioeconomic status, and we have three values, low, medium, and high. And we create two dummy variables, x sub one and x sub two, to represent membership of two of the categories. In this case, everybody who has low socioeconomic status scores a one, on the second dummy variable, and everybody who has medium socioeconomic status scores a one on the first dummy variable. Everybody else scores a zero on both of those dummy variables. So you can think of this table as telling us 
how are the original values of socioeconomic status recoded into these new variables? Well, everybody who used to score high now gets a zero on both variables. Everybody who used to score medium gets a one on the first variable and a zero on the second variable. And everyone who used to score low gets a zero on the first variable and a one on the second variable. So in this case, which group is the reference category? Well, it's the group that scores zero on all dummy variables. In this case, the high category is the reference category. So if we look at the regression formula, where we include these two dummy variables as predictors, we see that the intercept gives us the mean value for people who score zero on both dummies, and that's the high group. So the intercept tells us the mean value of the high group. The first slope tells us the mean difference between that reference group and the group encoded by x1. So the mean difference between high and medium socioeconomic status. And the second slope tells us the mean difference between the reference group and people who score one on x2. So that's the low category. So this slope tells us the mean difference between people who score high and people who score low. We can prove this by filling out the regression formula. So this is the regression formula for the predicted value y hat sub i. And if we complete this formula for people who score high on socioeconomic status, they score zero on both dummy variables. So we can just plug in the value zero here and a value zero here. Anything that's multiplied by zero is canceled out. So we can simplify this formula for people in the high socioeconomic status category to the predicted value is equal to the intercept A plus B sub one times zero is zero plus B sub two times zero is zero simplifies to A. So the mean value for socioeconomic status is the intercept A. If we complete this formula for people who scored medium on socioeconomic status, those people scored the value one for x sub one. So we plug in the value one here and we can simplify their formula to a plus b one times one plus b two times zero is a plus b sub one. So the mean value for people who score medium SES is the intercept A plus the difference between high and medium SES people, which is B sub one. And we can do the same by filling in the formula for the low socioeconomic status participants. And their formula simplifies to A plus B sub two. So the mean value for low socioeconomic status is the intercept A plus the difference between high and low socioeconomic status B sub two. So the intercept A tells us the mean value of the reference category and the B coefficients tell us the mean difference relative to that reference category for the group whose membership is encoded by that specific dummy. Of course, you can pick your own reference category. If you want to change the reference category, you can simply choose different dummy variables. So let's say you want to compare people to the low socioeconomic status category. In that case, just create two dummies, one that codes for membership of the high socioeconomic status group, one that codes for membership of the medium socioeconomic st status group, and everybody who scores zero on both of those dummies must be in the low socioeconomic status group. Now we might ask, how many degrees of freedom does such a regression model have? Recall that when we perform an F-test for the overall fit of a regression model, we have two different sources of degrees of freedom. The first is the degree of freedom for the regression model, and the second is the degrees of freedom for the residuals. The degrees of freedom for the regression model is given by the number of parameters minus one. So in this case, we have three parameters, specifically the intercept A, the first slope B sub one, and the second slope B sub two. So the degrees of freedom is three parameters minus one is two. And the second degrees of freedom are for the residuals, and those degrees of freedom are equal to the number of participants minus the number of parameters. So in this case, we don't know how many participants there are, but let's say it's 100 minus the number of parameters minus three, 
would be 97 degrees of freedom for the residuals. Let's have a look at some output for a general linear model with two dummy variables to represent membership of three categories. In this case, we are comparing people who are from the city, that's the reference category, to people who are from rural areas, to people who are from the suburbs. So we have three places of living, city, rural or suburban. We have two dummy variables to represent the mean differences compared to living in the city. And we have some outcome variable, which is the score on a post-test. It doesn't matter for this example what it is. So let's look at some example output from a regression analysis with two dummy variables to compare the mean values of a three category categorical variable. First of all, we get an R square. And this tells us that 21% of the variance in the dependent variable post-test is explained by this three level categorical predictor. Second of all, we get an ANOVA table, which gives us a significance test for that explained variance. In other words, this table answers the question does this regression model explain significant variance in the dependent variable post-test? Well, what we see is that the F value is 284.65 on 2,2130 degrees of freedom. So this is the numerator degrees of freedom for the regression, and this is the denominator degrees of freedom for the residuals. And that corresponds to a very small p-value, smaller than 0.001. We also get a table of coefficients, and there we see the intercept, the slope of the first dummy variable, and the slope of the second dummy variable. So what can we conclude from this table of coefficients? Well, first of all, the intercept gives us the mean value on post-test for the reference category. And the reference category consisted of people living in the city, so they scored on average 61.75 points on the post-test. The regression slope of these two dummies tells us how large the mean difference is between people living in the suburbs versus people who live in the city. And we see that people who lived in the suburbs scored on average 14.29 points higher on the outcome post-test. And this dummy tells us the mean difference between people living rurally versus people living in the city. And we see that people living rurally scored on average 2.30 points higher on the dependent variable post-test. Now we get standard errors for all of these coefficients and using those standard errors we can calculate t-values and corresponding p-values. So this first row for the intercept just tells us whether the mean score for people living in the city was significantly different from zero. And that's probably not a very interesting research question and unsurprisingly, the t-value is very large and the p-value is very small. So the mean value on the test is significantly different from zero for people living in the city. The second two rows are more interesting because these slopes test the mean difference between people living in the city versus people living suburbanly and people living rurally. So again, we divide the regression slope by its standard error to get a t-value this allows us to test a zero null hypothesis. So it allows us to test the hypothesis that this mean difference is equal to zero. And what we see is actually for both of these slopes, the mean difference is indeed significantly greater than zero. Until now, we've covered how you can use linear regression with dummy variables to model mean differences between more than two categories. But historically speaking, it has been more common to call this type of analysis ANOVA, which is short for Analysis of Variance. Now, the ANOVA model is mathematically identical to regression with dummies. So I want you to think about ANOVA as a different perspective on the same analysis, with a slight emphasis on different parts of the output that we would typically focus on when we use the regression interface. ANOVA relates to the general linear model, as the independent samples t-test relates to the general linear model. They are, at the core, both just examples of general linear models, but historically they have been viewed from a slightly different perspective. 
The so-called one-way ANOVA has one categorical predictor and one continuous outcome. What we get from the ANOVA is an omnibus test or an overall test of differences between group means for more than two groups. So this is exactly what we've learned so far. So far we've discussed regression analysis with dummy variables to represent membership of more than two groups, and then you could just look at the f-test for the explained variance to get an overall test of differences between group means. But for historical reasons, some fields call this type of regression with dummies a one-way ANOVA, and they tend to present the results in a particular way. And the reason that we're discussing this is that it's important that you are able to recognize this type of output and interpret it appropriately and understand at the same time that this is really just an example of the general linear model. If you perform the same analysis on differences between people living in the city versus people living in the suburbs and people living rurally, then these are the results that you would get from the one-way ANOVA analysis. The first table is labeled ANOVA, and there we see an F value of 284.65. And this is the omnibus test of differences between the means of those groups on the dependent variable post-test. If we compare this to the output of the regression analysis with dummies, we see that the F value is completely identical. In fact, the two models are mathematically indistinguishable, so if we see any difference between those F values, we made a mistake, because the analyses should be identical. We see that this F value has 2,230 2 degrees of freedom, and if we look at the results from the one-way ANOVA, we also see that we have 2,130 2 degrees of freedom. We also see the familiar sums of squares, and we see the familiar mean squares out of which this F value is calculated, and we see a p-value, and again this is the same p-value as we got for the f-test of the regression model. But we also see that the sums of squares have slightly different names now. So what we see is that the regression sum of squares is now called the between-group sum of squares, and that the residual sum of squares is now called the within-groups sum of squares, and the total sum of squares still has the same name. But you can verify that its values are identical. So here, let's see the regression sum of squares, 87,964, and the between-group sum of squares here is 87,964. They are the same. So how can we use either the one-way ANOVA interface or the regression interface with dummies to test a hypothesis about differences between groups? Well, the first step is that we formulate our hypotheses. So the goal of ANOVA is to compare the means of more than two groups, and a common default zero-null hypothesis is to say h-null is that the mean of group 1 is equal to the mean of group 2 is equal to the mean of group 3. And the implicit alternative hypothesis here is that the null hypothesis is not true. So the alternative hypothesis is not the null hypothesis. This null hypothesis is rejected if there are sufficient differences between any of the means. To reject the null hypothesis, it's not necessary for all three means to be different from each other. That could be the case, but we could also reject the null hypothesis if we find that mean 1 is equal to mean 2, but both of those means are smaller than mean 3. In other words, Observing a significant omnibus test for the ANOVA just means that the means of at least two of the groups differ. And of course, we can do follow-up analyses, for example, pairwise comparisons between different groups, to understand which of the groups differ significantly. Step two is to calculate a test statistic for this omnibus hypothesis test. So at this point it becomes relevant to ask, why is this called an analysis of variance when we are comparing group means, not comparing group variances? And the reason for that is because we are testing how large the variance in group means is relative to the error variance. In other words, we are performing an f-test to compare two sources of variance. Specifically, this f-test compares the mean square between groups relative to the mean square within groups. And the mean square between groups is calculated by taking the sum of squares between groups and dividing it by its degrees of freedom. 
and the mean square within groups is calculated by taking the sum of squares within groups and dividing it by its degrees of freedom. And of course, because I explained that ANOVA and regression are the same, this is identical to taking the sum of squares for the regression and dividing it by its degrees of freedom to get a mean square for the regression and dividing that by the mean square of the error, which is obtained by dividing the error sum of squares by the error degrees of freedom. And this f-test tells us how large are the between-group differences relative to the error variance. And if those between-group differences are large relative to the error variance, then we are going to reject the null hypothesis of no differences. So let's have another look at the output of the ANOVA. So we see here that this is the between groups sum of squares and its degrees of freedom. So we get the mean square for between groups by dividing this by its degrees of freedom. So we get 43,982 for the between groups mean square. And we get the within groups sum of squares or the error sum of squares, which is 329,000 and something with 2,130 degrees of freedom. If we divide this sum of squares by its degrees of freedom, we get a mean square of 154. And if you divide this mean square by this mean square, then you get the F value and that's very large. So the P value is going to be very small. We can use this interactive application to get an understanding of how ANOVA is the same as regression. In this case, we have three groups. We have a control group, an experimental group, and a placebo group. So this is an experimental study of the effect of different treatments. This is an example of the data that we get. So we have a dependent variable, which is the outcome score, and we have an independent variable, which is group membership. And people are either in the experimental group, or the control group, or the placebo group. We can code dummy variables. So in this case, our reference category is the control condition, and we have one dummy that codes for membership of the experimental group and another dummy that codes for membership of the control group. If we plot the data, then we can plot them in two different ways. So one is to see these data as an example of regression, in which case we have one group that scores zero on both dummies. That's represented by the green lines here. So let's zoom in to get a closer look. So the green group here is the control group it scores zero on both dummies, and this horizontal bar is the mean of that control group. One dummy codes for the difference between the control group and the experimental group, indicated here in orange. And the slope of that regression line tells us the mean difference between those two groups. And the placebo group, highlighted in purple, is represented by another dummy variable. And the dashed regression line here tells us the mean difference between the control group and the placebo group. But we can also visualize the same data like this, and this is more common in the ANOVA literature. So what we see here is that a black horizontal line indicates the overall mean across all three groups. So that's just the mean of the dependent variable test score. And then we see the mean of the green group here, and the mean of the orange group here, and the mean of the purple group here. And we see that those group means have some distances to the overall mean. So the mean square between groups is actually the mean square differences between the overall mean and the group means. In other words, the mean square of these dashed difference lines. And the mean square within groups is actually the mean square distance between the group means, so in this case, for example, the orange line, and the individual scores of people within that group. And that is the same as the mean squared error of individuals relative to the regression lines in this picture. If we look at the output for regression and ANOVA, we should see that they are identical. So for both analyses, we get an F-test, which might be labeled as ANOVA in SPSS. We see here 2,42 degrees of freedom, same as for the ANOVA interface, 2,42. We see sums of squares, 117 and 44, 117 and 44. We see the mean squares, 58.8, 1.07, 58.8, 1.07. We see an F value of 55.10, 55.10, and a corresponding very small P value for both analyses. And then we see something interesting. 
the coefficients of the regression analysis give us an intercept, which is the mean value of the control group, and it gives us the effect of two dummy variables, and those effects tell us the mean difference between that dummy variable and the reference category. But the ANOVA just gives us the different group means. So the control group scored on average 2.4, the experimental group scored on average 3.7, and the placebo group scored on average minus 0.19. So that's an interesting difference. Um, the regression analysis represents those three group means using one intercept and the slopes of two dummies. And the ANOVA interface just represents them as three different means. So the only difference here can be found in the coefficients table. So when I first introduced you to bivariate linear regression, I showed you an overview of the different sums of squares. And in the ANOVA literature, those different sums of squares tend to have slightly different names. So I thought I'd bring back that table and just give you both of the names for each of the sums of squares. So we have the total sum of squares, or SST. That is still the same as in regression analysis, and it's calculated as the sum of the square differences between individual values and the overall mean. And we have the sum of squares between groups, which is the same as the sum of squares for the regression equation. And that's calculated as the sum of the square differences between the individual predicted values and the overall mean. And we have the within groups sum of squares, or SSW, which is the same as the error sum of squares, and it is calculated as the sum of the squared differences between individual observations and their individual predicted values. And whereas we predict unique values for every individual when we use a continuous predictor, ANOVA has a categorical predictor, so we only predict one value for each category and that's that category's mean. So here's another way to visualize this. In this graph here on the right, we have one, two, three groups. The dashed green line represents the overall mean, so that's just the mean value of the dependent variable. And the dashed blue line here is the mean of group one, the dashed blue line here is the mean of group two, and the dashed blue line here is the mean of group three. The little black dots are individual observations within each of those groups. So the between group sum of squares is calculated based on squaring the distances indicated by these red arrows. So here we have three groups whose means differ somewhat from the overall mean and we could square those differences and add them up to get the between group sum of squares. And the within group sum of squares is the sum of the square distances between individual observations and their respective group means. So within group one, we see that this person scored higher than their group mean, this person scored lower, this person scored higher, this person scored lower, this person scored higher. We square all those distances and add them up, and we add them up across all of the groups to get the within group sum of squares or the error sum of squares. And then the total sum of squares is the sum of squared distances between individual observations and the overall mean of the dependent variable. So this is just a different visualization to understand what these different sources of sums of squares are. The third step is to determine the p-value for this ANOVA. So recall that the f-distribution has two degrees of freedom parameters. In the case of ANOVA, we can determine the numerator degrees of freedom by taking the number of groups minus one, and notice that this is the same as taking the number of parameters minus one, and the denominator degrees of freedom we get by taking the number of observations minus the number of groups. So if we have three groups, that's a number of observations minus three. And we call the numerator degrees of freedom the between degrees of freedom, and the denominator degrees of freedom we call the within degrees of freedom. We can then calculate the p-value either using statistical software. So for example, in Excel or other spreadsheet applications, we can use the function fdistrt, insert the f-value, insert the first degree of freedom and the second degree of freedom parameter, and then we get our p-value. In R, we can use this function, just plug in the f-value, the first degree of freedom and the second degree of freedom, set lower tail to false, 
or we can use the table in the Git book or any other statistics book. And the fourth step is to draw a conclusion. If our observed p-value is smaller than the significance level alpha, then the test is significant. That means that it's very unlikely to observe differences between group means at least as large as we observed. If the null hypothesis of no group mean differences were true, so if p is smaller than alpha, we act as if we believe that the null hypothesis is rejected. The final thing that I want to discuss is the concept of effect size in analysis of variance. For historical reasons, it is common to call the R square for ANOVA models eta squared, which is written as this, eta squared. It's important to realize that eta squared is literally the same as R squared. It's just the term that's given to R squared when our predictor is categorical. To prove this, Notice that eta squared is calculated as the between sum of squares divided by the total sum of squares, and r squared is calculated as the regression sum of squares divided by the total sum of squares. A few slides back, I showed you that the between sum of squares is just a different name for the regression sum of squares, so these two formulas are identical. There are rules of thumb on how to interpret this effect size, but funny enough, those rules of thumb differ from the rules of thumb for R square, which of course is super confusing and also illustrates just how arbitrary rules of thumb are. Nevertheless, I will reproduce here the rules of thumb for interpreting eta squared. A small effect size is indicated by a value around 0.01, a medium effect size by a value around 0.06, and a large effect size by a value around 0.14. Now, of course, this is completely different for the rules of thumb that I presented for interpreting R squared. So just don't put too much stock into it. And instead of using these rules of thumb blindly, just try to reflect on how meaningful it is to explain, for example, 14% of the variance in your outcome variable using between group differences. So how can we interpret the results from regression with multiple dummies or ANOVA analysis? Well, we start with the overall f-test for mean differences between the groups. So in this case, we see a high f-value and a significant p-value, so we conclude that there are mean differences between the groups. We can also look at the coefficient tests. So in this case, we're using the regression interface, which gives us the mean value of the first group and its standard error, t-test and p-value. So this tests the null hypothesis that this mean is equal to zero. And of course it's not. And these two coefficients give us the mean difference between the groups encoded for by their specific dummy variables and the reference category. So people who lived suburbanly scored 14.29 points higher on the outcome. And that difference is significant. So there is a significant difference between people living in the suburbs and people living in the city. And the same for people living rurally. So you could report those results as follows. Living environment, urban versus suburban versus rural, had a significant effect on test scores with an R squared of 0.21 and an F value on 2,230 2, degrees of freedom equal to 284.65 and a P value smaller than 0.001. Note that we could make different comparisons. So here I report two comparisons. So I compared urban participants to suburban and to rural participants. But with three groups, we could make in total three different comparisons. So we also could compare suburban and rural participants. So note that here I don't make all possible comparisons. I only compare suburban and rural participants to urban participants. And those comparisons seem to make sense to me because most people live in cities. So I thought it made sense to treat them as the reference category. But if you want to test other differences, you could simply change the reference category. So for example, if you make suburban participants the reference category, you automatically get the test for the difference between suburban and urban participants and for the difference between suburban and rural participants. This is assuming that you're using the regression interface. If you're using the ANOVA interface, you can ask for all possible comparisons at once. And in the tutorial, you will see how to go about that. There are a few important caveats with regards to the interpretation of results from ANOVA. 
The first is that standardized regression coefficients do not make sense when you're modeling the effect of dummy variables. So this applies both to ANOVA and to the independent samples t-test. Because a one standard deviation difference in a dummy variable for rural living doesn't make any sense. This variable doesn't have a meaningful standard deviation. So effect sizes like Cohen's D take the place of standardized regression coefficients when we're using independent samples t-test or ANOVA. The second thing is that significance tests for dummy variables only make sense if you want to compare groups to the reference group. And if you want to compare groups to another group, then you have to use different dummy variables. That's all of the material on ANOVA. For the tutorial this week, you will learn how to conduct ANOVA analysis using both the regression interface and the ANOVA interface. Good luck and see you next week. That's all you need to know to model between group differences using the general linear model or the ANOVA interface. Good luck in the tutorial and see you next week.